Hi everyone, this is Dr. Victoria Naule and here with me is Mr. Stephen Dow and Professor Philip Daniel uh, from the University of Dundee and my co-host for today's webinar is Ms. Lloyd, who is also from the University of Dundee. So in today's discussion, we're going to focus on taxation and, trans and transfer pricing of oil and gas in the oil and gas sector. But before we start, I would like our speakers to introduce themselves. I'll start with Professor Philip Daniel. He will introduce himself, giving us his profession background. And then thereafterwards, Stephen Dow will also introduce himself. And my co-host Lloyd will also introduce herself. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Daniel. I'm an honorary professor at the Center for Energy, uh, Minerals and Petroleum Law and Policy at the University of Dundee and uh, teach there in master's programs and do some supervision. Uh, before that, uh, I spent nearly 10 years at Fiscal Affairs at the IMF where I was deputy head of the tax policy division and then an advisor in the director's office and did uh, more than 50 country missions uh, advising and was co-editor of a couple of books, uh, one of which is very relevant to uh, this topic. Uh, and it's called International Taxation and the Extractive Industries. And it contains contributions not only by me, but by Dundee's very own Peter Cameron. So that's my introduction. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. Stephen Dow, would you like to introduce yourself? Very briefly. Um, I'm Stephen Dow. I'm Senior Lecturer in Energy Law at the Centre for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral Law and Policy at the University of Dundee. I have 25 years experience of teaching students from all around the world. I teach upstream issues and downstream issues as well, touch financing. Um, my interest is very much in, in, in gas and what happens with, with its uh, flow and its value chain, etc., um, and um, oil just is where the money is, and gas is kind of where the excitement is. That's kind of my view of the, um, how it all works. So it's supposed to work. That's Perfect. enough. Kevin Lloyd, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lloyd Lloyd Matias da Silva, and I am a student at the University of Dundee. I also have the pleasure to have Mr. Stephen Dow as one of my professors and also my advisor of studies. Um, so welcome everyone to our webinar in taxation and transfer pricing of multinational oil companies. And thank you, Dr. Victoria, for inviting me to co-host this webinar with you. Uh, thank you very much, Lloyd. Uh, we shall start with Stephen's introduction or brief background with respect to taxation and transfer pricing. Stephen, the floor is yours. Do you want me to share yeah, up slides? Yes, please. Uh, that one. Is that managing share? Yes, yes, you can do the slideshow. Just put the slideshow on. Yes, it's, it's very fine. Yeah. Mm. What I want to spend 15, 20 minutes talking about provoking people about is how transfer pricing thinks. Um, I was asked if what's the answer. I'm not actually very sure I know very much about what the answer is because I suspect the answer is very much um, in, on the individual circumstances. But I want to spend a few minutes talking about what, the, what governments are panicking about and why transfer pricing is controversial and why it's, occasionally it's just not controversial. What, 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 what's the real problem out there? Is there to my, my 15 minutes worth. I'll put my clock on and make sure I'm uh, rough at the time. Right. Transfer pricing in the bad old days. This is, you know, um, where it all started. What the idea of transfer pricing is to try and play games with tax. It, what it does is it plays games with the tax base. And if, if you can see this through its original idea um, or its original form. And what used to happen is that um, the producing company would sell its oil to its daughter company at very low price and pay tax to the, host, the, the producing state on that very low price. And that was the, 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 the original form of the ancient form of, of transfer pricing. But you can see its effect. What it does is it erodes the tax base. That particular form of transfer pricing isn't particularly difficult to deal with. All governments have to do at this point is uh, think about how, how they will actually write the rules to, um, to control the tax base itself. So all they do is simply say, instead of paying uh, tax on your actual proceeds, 
they will pay tax on the market value of the crude. So there's a deemed um, um, payment. In, so, so even if you actually go ahead, sell off the crude to your daughter company at a dollar a barrel or whatever it might be, um, then the government says that's not what really happened as far as the tax system is concerned. What we'll do is we'll charge you tax on the market price of the, of, of the crude. You can see the same thinking behind the, the posted price system of the um, 1950s, 1960s, where governments are simply saying, instead of paying tax on whatever you get, uh, the actual amount of money, you will pay tax on a deemed value. So in a posted price system, if the price is $10 a barrel, you can then simply say you will pay tax as if the price was $20 a barrel. And you can see that what this is doing is moving the tax uh, from the, um, it's, it's moving the tax base around. Um, what the, the, on the market value, you know, the, the government is simply protecting its, its tax base. On a posted price system, what the, 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 the producing government is doing is making sure that the tax base stays in its country rather than gets sent back to the home country of the, um, the foreign investor. So that form of transfer pricing just simply isn't a problem. You just change the rules, you get around it quite, quite easily and quite straightforward. It's, uh, it, isn't, it isn't a challenge. But that's kind of where the, the, the words come from, transfer pricing, meaning you're transferring at a, a, at a weird price. But remember, the idea here is you're playing games with the tax base. Now, in reality, um, you know, life gets a bit more complicated. When one easy route gets shut off for um, investors to try and play games and get some tax exemptions that some others might not think they're entitled to and some might think they're entitled to and start a discussion about. Um, remember that you know, um, in production sharing contracts in particular, it's the definition of the cost that matters. In the license world, it's the definition of the tax exemption, the, the, ta the tax allowance that matters. Because in the PSC, you want a qualifying cost since the government is taking cost risk. It says, remember, the PSC is basically a, a, an easy bargain. It says, we, the government, will underwrite your costs, um, allow you your costs, and then we'll share the, the remaining profit barrels. And because we, the government, have underwritten the cost in your downside, we, the government, will take most of the upside basic bargain of a, of a, of a PSC. It's, it's a nice story for everyone to tell. But because the government under a classic PSC is taking cost risk, anything which increases the qualifying costs is eroding the tax base for the producer government, right? And that is where the transfer pricing world starts to enter, in, uh, to, to enter into the cost definition world. Because frankly, cost definition can be a little bit of a problem. Um, we'll see in a second that cost definition and the problems of cost definition is partly why the gross split PSC is becoming more intriguing to government. There's a gross split, which is a, an odd form of PSC in a lot of ways. What it, it, it simply takes out the cost, um, the cost repayment and says, investor, costs are your problem um, and will simply uh, split the, 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 the revenue in a particular way set by government. Um, it pushes the cost problem to the, to the investor in the same way as a classic license does. Right? Um, the, the exception, the easy bit of costs is where there's a market for a particular service. So you go out you to the market, you find um, a driller, you find a caterer, you find a plumber, you uh, get competitive bids for, um, for the service that you want to do. And it's quite straightforward to demonstrate that you've got the best deal, you've got somebody who's qualified to do the, do the, do the work, etc. And it's quite straightforward to say that is a valid cost. And under a production sharing contract, there's nothing controversial about this. Here it is, you've demonstrated that you've got the best value. You, you might also demonstrate you've got the cheapest um, form of the service, but um, it's, it's clearly, it's, a, it's a, a, a cost associated with the um, reduction of drilling. You've demonstrated that you've got the best value. You've demonstrated that you've won the call for competition. Nothing particularly controversial. You can have other costs which are um, more problematic because they are, it's, it's, um, they, they're open to interpretation. So cost of meetings, you're allowed a meeting cost. Does that meeting mean you can have a meeting in Hawaii just because it's a nice place to go to? Does that mean you can have a meeting with lots of um, you know, hangers on? Does that mean you can have dinner after the meeting? Does that mean you can go to a Formula One meeting, uh, a Formula One race just in the same place the day after the meeting, you know, that kind of thing. And again, by controlling the cost definition, you can start to shut that down. Head office costs, um, because you know clearly, uh, it is not unreasonable for an investor to say that um, a proportion of head office costs go to a particular um, product producing asset 
um, the question then becomes what pro pro proportion of that of that head office cost. It's not the idea that's particularly controversial, it's the amount. Because if the investor says, well, I've got 10 fields, my head office cost has to be covered by those 10 fields. Oh, I sold one of them, I've now got nine. Can I simply increase the cost so that nine fields are now paying what 10? Well, that, that, that kind of debate is, um, is much harder to, for, the, for the, investor to, the investor to sustain. So you've got easy costs, you've got costs which are open to interpretation, and then you've got nightmare costs. This is where transfer pricing bites again. Because the nightmare cost is the one which doesn't have a market and it doesn't have, um, you know, it's, it's completely controlled by the investor. Let me show you. For example, you have a technology cost. So I've got, a, I'm, I'm an investor and I've got a particular piece of patented technology which um, enables me to extract more barrels out of every hundred in the ground than anyone else can. So that the, the government wants me because I will get more barrels, I will get more oil, there, there, we will get more, you know, there will be more money. But um, when I use my patented technology, what I do is I, I, I sell a license to use that technology to my daughter company, which is the operator, producer, whatever we want to call it in, in, the, in the host country. And I don't sell this technology to anybody else other than my daughter companies, which are the, in, uh, the, the operators in the various countries in which, my, which, I, would, in which I hold acreage. Right? So there's no market for this. And every, the, the, the price for this is set by me, um, and I simply charge a license fee to each of my daughter companies. And this is my competitive advantage. I, I'm not going to sell this to my uh, fellow oil companies because this is what distinguishes me as a great oil company in the world from them as just good oil companies in the world, just be provocative and um, pejorative. I don't license it to anyone outside the group. There's no market in which the, the, the license fee is set. I just simply set the fee for whatever I want to set it for, which then becomes, is this a valid qualifying cost? Because this is effectively a transfer price. Um, what I'm doing is I'm simply saying, if this is a qualifying cost, I'm going to take it at, I'm going to, um, it's going to be paid, um, it's, it's at the government's risk. Um, paid by government spark costs, I just absorb, I, I, I just, I, I get that, right? If that cost is be permitted, what stops the investor simply increasing the fee? So I say, pick, to pick a ludicrous number, I charge $5 million a day for my um, um, daughter company to use this technology this year. And then next year, because the government is crazy enough, mad enough, good enough, the least is applicable, to allow me that cost, then next year I say, well, I'll charge $6 million a day. And the following year, I charge $7 million a day. But remember, I am charging all of my daughter companies that fee and it's going to be the same. So it's not as if I am prejudicing one particular um, producer. Um, I'm not crazy enough to say, you know, um, in, if I go to operate in jurisdiction A, I'll charge a million dollars a day. And if I go to operate in jurisdiction B, I'll charge $5 million a day. It's, 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 it's the fee that's always charged by the parent to the daughter company. And um, I, I think it would be different if I started to charge different fees. I think it's hard for me to justify as an operator if I give one country um, this cheap in inverted commas and another company country has to pay more for it. Um, there might be some reason I can dream up to do this, but I think it's a harder argument to, to sustain to say this is the technology cost if um, then um, I'm charging different fees for different countries. If however I charge a, a flat fee, I can make an argument that that genuinely is the technology cost to me. Now the great thing about me making this argument is that the government doesn't have any data to fight with me. This is a classic information asymmetry. I am the only person who knows what this technology costs. I am the only person who knows what it really costs. I'm the only person who sets the fee. And so whatever, the, when the government comes to me to say, you know, tell me a story as to how this fee is justified, I will find a way to do it. Right? Whether it's um, simply, I'm not gonna lie to the government um, because that, that's just, you know, if you lie to governments, then governments are quite rightly gonna get upset, gonna start uh, taking enforcement proceedings and all the rest of it. I'm not going to lie to the government. I just might not give them all the information that they, 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 they could possibly want because they don't ask for it, because they don't know to ask for it, because I'm the only person with data. Right? So the government's got a problem here. The government has a real problem here. And the question then becomes, is this a valid cost? Right. Next part of this is, what do governments do? Well, you can do nothing except it as a cost and potentially see the tax base eroded. That is an option. 
You can disallow the cost, which simply says, you know, there's no market for this. Um, we're just simply not going to play this game at all. We, the government, will um, simply say, you know, you're, you're, you're not getting this at all. Now, if you're not going to, the government, remember, wanted me as the investor, it, and it wants to be the basic idea of a PSC that government takes cost risks. So it might give me something back through some form of an uplift of costs. So it says on the market costs, instead of having 100% of market costs, you can have 125% of market costs just to pick a random number. Um, and that compensates me for not getting my non-market costs paid as qualifying costs. Or the government can split the difference and so allow some sort of proportion of costs. Um, and it can say, you know, non-market costs, we just, we think, we think the million dollars a day is too much, but we will pay you a quarter of a million dollars a day, or whatever it is. Now, that gets you into horrible territory in law because there's no real, um, you know, there's, there's no real methodology to, to, to allow that. that that's that's in, in completely arbitrary territory. So what logically the thing to do as government is, or the, the, logically the legal thing to do is simply to disqualify the cost. And so if you're disqualifying the cost, you have two options. You can simply say, this is a standard PSC, it will disqualify the cost. Or you can look at the big picture and you can say, well, this is part of the drive towards um, you know, the, the gross split and changing the, the classic production sharing contract into what some people are calling the modern production sharing contract, the gross split PSC. Now, gross splits are quite new. They haven't been around all that long. We don't really know that much about them. And they're quite odd things um, because they're really changing the nature of the PSC. Um, what is odd is the, the Indonesia poster child um, starter of the, the gross split. The government seems to be talking about um, getting a bigger share of the total revenues while the investor is taking more risk. And that to me is a hard story to tell. Because what a gross split does is it simply says, we're not having a qualifying cost, there's no cost oil. And we'll simply split the, um, the total revenue in a way which the government determines. So it takes out all these classic arguments about you know, the interpretation of the cost. Is that meeting cost allowed? Is that head office cost allowed? How do we interpret this particular thing? Have you really tested the market for, for drilling? Have you really tested the market for catering? Have you really tested the market for plumbing? Have you demonstrated that this uh, really is a cost? Um, and, and all those debates which go on forever inside governments and companies are, are simply removed um, by the gross split. That doesn't mean all the debate is removed because what the gross split does instead is it says, we'll split the total revenue according to the technical characteristics of the field. So if it's a difficult field, the investor can have a bit more. How do we define difficult field? Well, it's all down there in the gross split PSC, which says, you know, if these characteristics are met, you get an extra 2%. If these characteristics are met, you get an extra 1%. If these characteristics are met, you get whatever. Um, remembering the government's in control. And all that does is move the debate from, is this a qualifying cost to, is this, a te is this um, technical requirement actually met? Now, it sounds easy for lawyers to say, yeah, it's easy, the technical requirement is met, yes or no. Um, it's actually a lot harder in practice because people can reasonably disagree as to whether the technical characteristic has been shown by this particular survey, by this particular well, et cetera. There is space for interpretation here, therefore there is space for argument. So if you're looking at the big picture and saying, let's get rid of costs and stop fighting about costs, remember that doesn't mean you stop fighting about everything. You can also go to, um, as um, PSCs evolve in inverted commas, you can also go to the magic of revenue sharing. And what revenue sharing does is simply say, um, you're gonna bid your tax rate. Um, the India discovered gas fields round is the classic on this. Basically what happened there is over the last 20, 25 years, the Indian state gas companies have found a disturbingly large amount of gas um, onshore, um, but have been unable to develop it because the government won't give them the money to pay the, the capex. And so they're sitting there, they've got a whole bunch of proven gas fields. They've got a, a, a growing and an increasingly sophisticated gas market. They've got a set of regulated prices. So in, in essence, when the government says, right, hey, who wants these fields? What they bid is, um, you know, you, you know how much gas there is, you know what the price is, you therefore know the total revenue. And so you're effectively bidding, how much of this total revenue are you gonna keep for yourself paying the costs and for your profit? And how much are you going to give to the government as tax? So 
you're, you're bidding your tax rate. And so what you're doing is avoiding the cost and avoiding the transfer price problem simply by saying costs become the risk of the investor. Um, the India discovered gas field round is, is an amazing example of um, just, just great thinking. It, it's, it's an astonishing piece of uh, you know, government ingenuity. Um, and, it, and, it, and it worked. Um, it's a lot less obvious how a revenue share applies to an unknown oil volume and an unknown oil price. You know, come and bid me your tax rate on this field. It's a bit harder to do that when all you've got is um, you know, a few seismic results um, and you don't even know whether there's really any oil down there. But you can see that um, as soon as you start talking about transfer pricing, you get off into all sorts of what looks like a tangent but isn't really, because what you're really doing with transfer pricing is playing games with the cost base, um, playing games with the tax base. And um, the response doesn't have to be as, you know, in the ancient form of, of transfer pricing, the response is very specific. It says, don't do that. Right? And if you do, we'll pretend you haven't. Okay, so you've sold oil at low price, we'll just simply say, we don't care. The response to the much more sophisticated problem of transfer pricing, like technology costs, et cetera, has to be um, much more big picture. It's not, it's not easy to say, I'm simply going to you know, deal with this and try and overcome the information asymmetry and understand that this really is the proper cost for this technology. It's, it's, it's difficult to do that. So if what you're going to do is take the logically and legally obvious way out and say no costs this is the world you're in you're in the world of gross splits you're in the world of licenses you're in the world of revenue sharing you're simply getting away from um saying you know this is a tax allowance and making it the problem of the uh, of the investor rather than the problem of the government how am i doing for time not bad that's me was that provocative enough for philip daniel Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think your mic is off. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, as I said, my, my, I'm Philip Daniel. My first name's Philip. And my last name is Daniel, which often confuses people. Um, I say hello to a number of attendees who are students uh, on my courses, and thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, that was very interesting indeed, and in the course of what I have to say, one or two things may, may come up there. Uh, I mentioned a book called International Taxation and the Extractive Industries uh, as we started. Uh, I can't claim to be an expert on transfer pricing matters. There are many people who make their whole livelihoods from it, but I'm particularly grateful for two authors in that book. Um, one is Stephen Shea of Harvard Law School, and the other is Jack Calder, who was a colleague at the IMF after having spent many years as deputy head of the UK's oil taxation office. So they, they knew something about it, and uh, I did what I could to learn a bit from them. Um, transfer pricing is the transfer of value between commonly controlled businesses. In other words, it's broader than just a matter of ownership. As Stephen de described, you can have vertically integrated companies. You can also have uh, affiliates. Now, before we get too afraid of the concept, uh, a large portion of international trade, that is of goods and services that cross borders, takes place under transfer pricing and this definition. It takes place between commonly controlled businesses. Uh, I think in fact, it's a majority of international trade. So it is with us and it is with us always. Now governments in their tax law or uh, the regulatory authority looking after a, con a contract usually has a power to adjust prices to what appear to the authorities to be an appropriate price. So transfer pricing is not necessarily what we might call abusive transfer pricing. And uh, what Stephen had to say was very helpful in describing uh, a lot of abusive transfer pricing practices. <clears throat> 
Now, the standard way of uh, trying to identify a transfer price is to make some comparison with a version of an arm's length price. And there's a great deal of literature uh, trying to define what arm's length prices might be. But at core, it is attempting to find some kind of equivalent market pricing that can reasonably be used and doesn't lead to abuse of the system, uh, enhancement of the cost base, reduction of revenues, and so on. The standard manual on transfer pricing comes from the OECD, the Paris-based uh, rich country club, but it's now well complemented by material from the UN and the United Nations manual on transfer pricing methods is extremely helpful to developing countries. Under the OECD framework, there are five standard methods of arriving uh, at an arm's length price for <coughs> transfer pricing purposes. The first is commonly known as a CUP, a C-U-P, a com comparable uncontrolled price. Now that is finding a market price uh, that is appropriate to use for the revenue item or the cost item surveying the market. Uh, I shall describe an offshoot of that, which arose in South America called the sixth method at the end. So that's the first, the comparable uncontrolled price or cup. The second method is the resale price method. Can you estimate for this transaction or for this good or service, what it would fetch in the market on resale? The third method is to go for a transaction without a profit margin, which often happens between oil companies, and allow a certain cost plus amount on that. And there are benchmarking firms and so on, which identify what the cost plus might be. Now, remember that the relevant tax authority uh, has, uh, um, has to accept the method that is used. Uh, the fourth in the OECD's list is what you would call, uh, what is called rather complicatedly, the transactional net margin method. Uh, and that is where the margin on the transaction is compared either with the seller or buyer's own arm's length transaction or with another one you can find in the market. And fifthly then, you have the transactional profit split method. And you see that used, for example, uh, in the residual price mechanism that Australia adopted uh, for its offshore oil and gas with respect to its petroleum resource rent tax. And that simply says there is a gap between the value to the seller and the value to the purchaser, and that value will simply be split between the parties, and that will be accepted for tax purposes on both sides. Now, the sixth method uh, is an adaptation of the comparable uncontrolled price, and that was first used, I believe, in Brazil. Stephen may be able to correct me. And instead of searching the market for a comparable uncontrolled price, the government or an international organization maintains a database of comparable prices. Now, for example, the Inter-American Center on Tax Administration, CIAT, C-I-A-T, does this. Uh, if you look up CIAT or look up accountants that deal with that area, you will see reference to the CIAT database uh, of comparable uncontrolled prices that can be applied in some circumstances. And I believe the Brazilians legislated such that their tax office could use this to assign prices to uh, transactions that they felt were not at arm's length or with market prices. Now, those are the, the six conventional methods and people in accounting firms make a very good living uh, helping companies and sometimes governments to apply these methods. One only needs to use one of the methods. An alternative, of course, 
is for the parties to agree yet another method of their own and to get the authorities to do it, uh, to accept it. Now, that is what happened when I conducted negotiations on a couple of agreements and a unitization uh, for the government of East Timor was that uh, a rate of return method uh, was used. Uh, it was put to scrutiny of the authorities of both East Timor and uh, Australia, uh, and an agreement was reached that the methodology could be used. The methodology didn't actually set a price, but it was the methodology that would be applied in reaching a price. Now, in individual transactions, the main problem uh, is that the seller and the buyer uh, will, as is the definition, be under common control, and there will be a lack of adverse interests. Now, by adverse interests, we mean that the buyer is in interested in the lowest price possible, and the seller is interested in the highest price uh, uh, possible. So that's some of the general material now, in the oil industry, it is very common for ventures around the world to be unincorporated joint ventures. Now, that's a, a, a legal arrangement, which is not a partnership, and nor is it an incorporated company. It is where uh, all costs and revenues are shared uh, by the parties to the joint venture agreement. As many of you will know, one of those parties will usually be the operator. Now, the operator and the non-operator parties therefore have adverse interests. Both have to supply cash, but only one is actually purchasing and applying things. Now, the presence of that adverse interest is very important in looking after costs in the oil industry. And it is something on which governments can perhaps piggyback. So let me come into the oil sector. First of all, what is the incentive to abusive transfer pricing? Well, the main incentive is that the concentration of higher tax or production sharing in favor of the government is usually in the upstream. That is where the rent, the surplus over all the minimum necessary cost of production, is to, that's where the rent is supposed to reside. So if you are operating in some kind of vertically, vertically integrated company or in a project where there is upstream material, upstream facilities, where there is a pipeline, for example, as in gas, where there are then processing plants, uh, which are used in different ways. There are, of course, transfer prices at each of these stages. There's a possibility of abusive transfer pricing. So the authorities have a role in determining what the price will be. And of course, there is the idea of capturing rent. Now, if the taxation or the production sharing in favor of the government is much higher in the upstream, then of course, the, part, the, the private parties have a big interest in moving uh, costs upstream. Uh, and, and that is why it is appropriate to develop formulae uh, for the proper cost plus or the proper co profit split in moving between the two phases. There's a lot of opportunity for abusive transfer pricing, principally because uh, there are international transactions involved and there are international means of minimizing tax, not least passing transactions through tax havens where they may, may be lightly or perhaps not taxed at all. And there are means uh, in um, tax law of dealing with that problem. Then, as both Stephen and I have mentioned, there is the vertical integration of companies so that they can shift costs from activities which are lightly taxed to activities which are heavily taxed. However, there's a counterpart there sitting in favor of the government. Now, on the output side, on the revenue side, it should be considerably easier to value crude oil than it is to value many other project, 
uh, products. And it certainly implies that it's probably easier to value crude oil products um, than it is to value many mineral products. The issue, of course, is sales to affiliates and, as in the broad case, how to establish an arm's length price. Well, we do have some advantages. From any one reservoir, there's usually a consistent quality of oil. The measurement of quality differences between crudes is reasonably straightforward, and if a government doesn't have the capacity, it can hire it. There are many international quoted benchmark prices, and you'll be familiar with many of them, Brent, West Texas Intermediate, Dubai, uh, and so on. Quantities in total can be monitored by good physical monitoring systems. You'll be aware both from tales from Iraq and from Nigeria of intervention with monitoring systems being a key to misappropriation of oil and to false or abusive transfer pricing. You may, of course, with crude oil, need an adjustment for transport costs. And once again, there are benchmarks and there are exchange, um, there are exchanges which, uh, on which uh, freight costs are listed. Now, those are all potential advantages, but it doesn't take away from the considerable administrative difficulty and the compliance risks. Uh, I once visited BP's trading floor in London and found that daily and hourly they were monitoring something approaching 200 different benchmark prices. Now, it is difficult for a government to replicate that, so it needs to reach agreement with companies on what benchmarks will be used and where the source of information will be. I've mentioned, and Stephen here is an expert, the greater complications in gas, because there, there is much more in the decision chain or what people call the value chain, and many more points of transfer between affiliates or commonly controlled uh, activities. So gas is a lot more difficult, but uh, the UK's own HMRC has published comprehensive guides, many of them written by Jack Calder, on how to do the valuation in that sector. Now, turning uh, finally to transfer pricing on costs coming in. Here again, uh, one thing that surprises me quite a lot is how little governments piggyback on what joint ventures with adverse interests do to keep each other under control. Now, those of you who are familiar either with joint venture agreements or with production sharing contracts will know that they have very detailed accounting procedures uh, in them that describe how services and assets transferred between affiliates will be valued. So there are international rules commercially observed on which governments can uh, rely. The risk areas include the transfer of used assets, of course, and you'll see a lot of rules about that. Management charges. Are the transfers of services and so on at cost plus or uh, at cost? What happens to the treatment of interest charges? And that's one of the good things in production sharing contracts that often interest charges are not recoverable or deductible. I'd like to say briefly something about the gross split, which was mentioned. Uh, I see the point, but I'm not entirely sure that the cost risk is entirely transferred uh, to the investor. Um, the Canadians attempted an approach to this, which is simply uh, essentially charging a very large royalty. Uh, the Canadians attempted this and abandoned it in Alberta. The reason, of course, is that you never solve the asymmetry of information if you are never studying costs. So when the company comes to you and said, this gross print is unsustainable, or we can't invest under it, you do not have the knowledge to challenge that. So one of the important things about monitoring costs is not just to take the challenge of monitoring today, but to be equipped for the negotiations you need to do tomorrow. So in conclusions, in conclusion, to do this needs a coherent risk-based approach. Um, and uh, 
that's common modern practice in tax administrations, and it can be done. It's a question of tooling up for it, concentrating on what really needs to be done and not what uh, does not needs to be done. Personally, I think that ring-fenced production sharing arrangements where the accounts are internal to one project or contract, or contract with adverse interests among the private parties in the project are a great help to government in dealing with abusive transfer pricing problems. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much, Stephen, for the brilliant presentation. Now, without wasting any time, we shall proceed to the Q&A. If you have any questions, do send them out. But in the meantime, I will invite my co-host, Lloyd, to ask some of the questions we received before the webinar. Lloyd, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, and again, thank you so much for both speakers, uh, Professor Phil Tanner and Mr. Stephen Dow for your presentation. Um, so the first question is for Mr. Stephen Dow, um, and the question is regarding patent technology. So the question is, is patent technology really helping the host country economy, or in this case, just multinational oil companies? Sorry, just practicing, pressing the button twice to make sure I, uh, I actually remember it on mute. Hmm, this is a, an odd way of expressing a question. Um, if the government doesn't think the patented technology, which is going to go into the work program, etc., is useful to the country, it should not be approving that work program. I think is the the, the only real way to answer a question like that. Um, it's, it's a ni nice idea. I like I like the thinking behind the question, but that would take days and weeks to, to talk through. So, so, but the bottom line in law is that remember that. What a production sharing contract and a license does is it gives the government as much control as it wants to have. Right? And there's all sorts of, you know, is this enough? But, but, but the structure of the contract is, good, is, is to give the government as much control as it wants. And if it wants to be able to kick that out, it should be able to do that um, through its uh, you know, consent um, protocols for the, for the work program. I'll stop at that. Do so, you want to dive in there? Uh, no, not, not particularly. Fair um, I, I do. I do just pick up uh, your point in the chat, um, Stephen, which is which is clearly uh, correct. Uh, cost does matter to both the operator and non-operator, um, but it's the non-operator who doesn't have control over the costs, and for that reason, the accounting procedure of the joint ventures uh, is very, very important and is something on which I think governments could rely rather more than they do. I think that's a lovely point that the government actually, that if what's going on inside the venture is actually also useful data to government. And I, th I think that, that, that if that's the, the takeaway from today. And you know, I've really learned something in there. That, that's an excellent point. Anyway, sorry, Lloyd, you were next question. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tiva, for the answer, and thank you, Professor Philip, as well, for, for adding up. Uh, the second question is for Prof Professor Philip Daniel, and um, so the question is regarding transfer price abuse, and the question is, should COVID-19 and its results to the worldwide economy force the law to adapt or bend concerning transfer price abuse legislation? Well, that's a very good question indeed, and... Um... I, I, I'm probably not going to answer it by saying that transfer pricing legislation should be altered, but I think it makes it especially important, and this is not just in the oil industry, that contracting procedures for services and goods are followed. The thing that has gone wrong in a great deal of government procurement during COVID is the emergency single source procurement. Uh, that's where the abuses have come. And I know that there's good excuse for that in some cases, and maybe you need to, um, you need to correct it in retrospect. But that's about procurement of COVID-19 PPE, emergency services, and all the rest of it. There really isn't any excuse uh, for why, say, the practices of an oil company in procurement should have become non-competitive and not market related as a result of COVID. I, I don't think that should have happened. And government should be using their regular enforcement practices. 
Thank you so much, Professor Philip Daniel. Um, Mr. Stephen, would you like to add up to this question? I would unmute. Um, I would very much agree with that. I think the, the response is less in the detail and more in the, the, the functioning of the um, procurement function. You know, the actual got to make it work. There's no excuse for um, you know failing to use uh, market comparators when or markets when you know rather than get, and, and having lots of bidders. And there's the but when, when you know there's not actually a um, you know unless you absolutely need to. Right? And, and that's basically what Philip said. I, I agree with that. Thank you so much, uh, for, uh, Mr. Stephen Dow. So the next question is for both of our speakers, um, and the question is. What is your personal opinion on the current taxing system in extractive resources and the transition to a low carbon future? So should the taxation system continue to change in order to fasten the transition to a low carbon future? Yes or no and why? Ooh. Stephen, do you want to have a go? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the hospital pass. You get to go first on this one. This is, is a monster um, because there's so much, there's so, so many connections here which aren't, quite as um, obvious as they might be. Uh, it, it, a lot of this boils down to what do you use the um, money you raise from oil to actually do? And one of the huge problems in the energy transition is that there are a number of countries in the world where oil taxation is virtually the only source of revenue for governments. And in the event that oil taxation disappears, i.e. people stop buying oil, then they don't have anything to fall back on. Um, they've got nothing else. Um, and, and, and the response to that is very much about diversity of the economy, which then suggests that you should be using oil revenues to help diversify the economy. And it, it gets into that kind of debate. Um, I think the, the, the biggest long term problem, though, is what the tax base in uh, after the energy transition looks like for, country, for, for countries who are currently dependent on oil revenue. Um, and I think that that is a is a question I, I have no idea what that looks like. I, I mean, what in the renewable sector, what do you tax? I mean, you can't tax wind. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, what is it? The thing, what is the thing that the government is actually? Um, uh, you know, what what is the, the tax base going forward? Um, the the question really relates to the interim. Um, if I was a country who is trying to look for oil now and trying to become dependent on oil for the next 20 years, I think I'd be thinking very hard um, rather than simply trying to copy what countries have done for the last 40, 50 years. Um, I, I think, you know, um, if I'd had 40 years of production, I'd be in a happier position than if I'm going to get 20 years of production. Um, and I'm going to defer to Philip at this point. Um, th th those are fair. I, I, I really only have a supplementary comment. I mean, obviously, in a, in a perfect world uh, where we were all governed by the United Nations, uh, we would be allocating the right to produce to the poorest countries. And uh, places like the UK, Norway and Saudi Arabia would be kindly asked to keep their oil in the ground uh, and use their other wealth to keep going. Now, I'm afraid that's very unlikely to happen, but you can think of it happening in a, in a mini way. Um, let's turn around what used to be the argument about how you should structure a fiscal regime. And I played my own part in this um, in pre-climate change days, if you see what I mean. I mean, there was a view which became prevalent in Norway in their tax system and in the UK that you should progressively do away with royalties after you've started uh, your oil industry. You should move more to something that is really, uh, sorry, you should move away from anything that is like a gross split. Because remember, though the gross split description is very fashionable, it's, it really only means that your royalty is very high. That's, that's all it means. Now, one way to keep more oil in the ground is to charge a higher fee for getting access to it. So it's to make it more expensive to get exploration rights, and it's to make it more expensive to produce, which you do by introducing a high royalty. The problem with that, of course, is that those poor countries with very marginal new projects coming on stream 
will have a trouble, have a problem. They may get nothing at all. Whereas the very cheap oil that comes out, say, from Saudi Arabia can bear quite a, quite a heavy cost. But it is worth remembering that having a royalty of some kind and those upfront charges is a way of implementing a depletion policy if you don't do it by means of the way you license your resources. And having been unfair to Norway in some of my remarks there, I will say that Norway is doing actually a rather good job of taking account of wider issues in its current uh, licensing policy. So you can do it by setting charges higher, or you can do it by regulation. All right, uh, thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Lloyd. I guess we are running out of time and this will be the end of our webinar. I don't know if you have any questions from other people. No, we don't have any questions, but I note that this is the second time we're discussing the issue of taxation and transfer pricing in the oil and gas sector. The first time it was only Stephen Dow who made a presentation. So you can go to my YouTube channel, look out for his presentation. And also I'll be sharing with you all the slides and I'll also share with you the link to Professor Philip Daniel's book on taxation in the oil and gas sector. So this marks the end of our webinar. I'll just give our speakers uh, like two minutes to do like a few closing remarks. So I'll start with uh, Professor Philip Daniel, just the closing remarks with respect to taxation and transfer pricing, specifically what should policymakers look out for? I, uh, first of all, Victoria, thank you very much for the invitation and for hosting and Lloyd for managing uh, the questions. Uh, I don't think there are easy answers to this. Uh, we've brought out two important matters. Uh, one is that governments have devices uh, such as the use of intra-company, intra-venture information that they can get and rely on, whether they're a participant or not, uh, which can help. Uh, in dealing with abusive transfer pricing. Uh, the second matter that came out was not really transfer pricing. It was about the climate change and the energy transition. And we did see that possibly the balance of fiscal systems could change more in the direction of upfront charges. And not only might that help governments with reliable revenue, but it might imply that there is uh, fewer oil projects are actually economic. So rather fewer fossil fuels would be produced. But thank you very much, everyone. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip Daniel. I'll go to Stephen Dow, your closing remarks with respect to Again, thank you very much for this opportunity to have some discussion and be, be provocative without um, you know, much responsibility coming back to me. Um, I think we've learned two things out of this. One, governments have lots of tools. And the problem is often that governments aren't using these tools or aren't being seen to use these tools. We've seen bits and pieces which come up in the chat and the questions that, you know, you, you can look at this and there are actually mechanics for governments to do things which some of them don't seem to be doing. So I think enforcement is, is, is very important. But whenever you go to enforcement, you have to remember what exactly you're going to enforce. So the detail that Philip talked about is, is, is of incredible importance when you're actually going to enforcement. And, and thank you very much. Thanks again. All right, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Professor Philip. I'm sure our viewers uh, will share with you their contact details in case you have any other questions with respect to taxation and transfer pricing. Do not forget our upcoming webinar on the 12th of this month. Uh, of this month, yes, it's about energy justice and climate change justice. So we'll be discussing various issues with respect to energy justice. How can developing countries? Uh, utilize their resources and at the same time be mindful of the environment. I'll let my co-host say her concluding remarks. Lloyd. Hey everyone again. Uh, thank you so much uh, Mr. Stephen Dow and Professor Philip to answer the questions and uh, thank you as well Dr. Victoria for this webinar. Uh, I could see that we have uh, one last question, uh, but like Dr. Victoria said, we're sharing the email from Professor Phil Pan and Stephen Dow, so please feel free to email uh, your questions to them. And thank you everyone for being here today. All right, thank you very much. This marks the end of our webinar. Bye-bye and see you on the 12th of this month. Bye-bye, thank you very much. <laughs>